Sometimes you forget about the first person. The one that started it all. You know, we have some of the greatest assets in the world here in Cleveland. It's also some of the best kept secrets. He grew up in a poor neighborhood in Cleveland. The town was down, nobody was doing anything. Vandalism and some fires between 103rd and 125th and Superior. The damage is extensive as blocks of stores and apartment buildings were destroyed. I mean, it was, it was pretty dire. Nick was a man that really wanted this city to succeed. Worked as a, a mailman, literally a postman went to Bowling Green for college and then went to Ohio State for law school and became a lawyer. The only way I know to make bad things into good things is with action, not with conversation. You can't argue with the people, you have to show them they're wrong. That's my experience. The arena in downtown Cleveland was an old facility. It was there since the 30s. He thought, what in the world are you doing with this great facility in downtown Cleveland with all this opportunity and not booking anything on it? I do remember when the Cincinnati Royals would come into the arena, they'd play like 10 games here. That was our only look at the NBA. And boy, you wanted more. A city of Cleveland that had 750,000 people back in the 70s. He saw a need, a great need for an NBA team here. So, you know, enter the Cleveland Cavaliers. We should look for having a coach within 30 days, which will give them time to get organized and get ready for a rookie camp if we have one in the camp and the exhibition games. We've already set some exhibition games and uh, <laughs> we're off. <laughs> it's almost basketball time. And interestingly enough, it went his way, the call did. So he gets the technical even though they called traveling on Shepard, Bill Fitch. Well, Fitch was a unique personality. Uh, like I tell them, I'm not the coach, I'm the doctor. And a lot of times, if the patient doesn't listen to you, well, you have to give them a little extra type medicine. You know, at times, one of the writers went to him and said, Coach, do you realize everybody on this ball club hates you? And he says, good, they're finally together on one thing. Bill, how do you think your players feel about you personally? Well, Joe, I think if you go into coaching and, and expect to, to win a popularity contest, uh, you've, you've gone into the wrong occupation in the first place. He was one of the guys that really helped me understand what it was going to take to play in this league. And it just wasn't about your skill level. It was about what you were going to have to have every single night. Work hard, don't complain, be tough, be courageous. That's the history of living in the Midwest. And they basically drafted a lot of us like that, all from the Midwest. John Johnson was the original number one draft choice of the Cavs. We feel that uh, this is what we drafted for professional basketball, a complete player. He's an exceptionally fine ball handler. He's played both guard and the forward position in the Big Ten. He was ahead of his time. At his size, many of do what he could do. That was right about the time when they were allowing big men to do a little bit more than play under the basket. My father always did say Cleveland was one of the cities, no matter how good or bad they are, they had the most die-hard loyal fans, and they were gonna be ruthless <laughs> when you were an opposing team. There was so many different guys coming in and coming out, but I would call, we were a transient team. We had guys coming, going, getting hurt, leaving. Oh yeah, I had never lost that many games in my life. Matter of fact, my first year was five times as many games I had lost in my lifetime. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I saw Bobby Bingo Smith uh, break down and cry one night. He just said, I don't know why we don't win. Why can't we win? We're trying hard. I'm not satisfied. I understand what happened, but I think we're going to have to make some changes. It was, it was some bad times. You played for bigger crowds in high school in Washington than you have here in Cleveland in the NBA. Is that depressing? 
sometimes it becomes a little discouraging, but uh, hopefully uh, things will improve uh, in the future, especially with the new building coming. Ground was broken for Nick Maletti's Sports Coliseum in Richfield Township on March 16, 1973. We think it's a positive solution to a problem. We project 16 months to build and we'll have a facility that I think will be the finest of its kind. To say, well, this is a nice Madison Square Garden, but you should see the Coliseum in our town. Now we're talking. To leave that arena and go to the new house, uh, Unless you really experience it uh, and have been through it, uh, you, you, you probably can't appreciate the feeling we have. We just have to do a job now and uh, build on the strengths, and there are strengths. I think we have a good nucleus. We got 10 ball players returning. We got a healthy Austin car. We just acquired Jimmy Clemens. Dwight Davis, the number one draft choice. Walter Cleveland draft. Dwight Davis. We were fortunate to get enough guys who were about winning as opposed to stats. And that changed everything. Uh, our needs right now uh, are for a premium center. And there, there may be a couple out. Uh, Jimmy Jones was rumored in this hardship. Campy and Jim Brewer and Footsie Walker and Jim Jones. All those guys started coming. And then all of a sudden, we started getting some stability. The man that was the catalyst, was the fella who came off the bench for about five minutes a half, and that was Nate Thurman. He was at the end of his career, an illustrious career, but he, along with the coach, molded a group of guys that made that run. We, we set out to be in the playoffs in five years, and I have the confidence to believe that we're gonna be there. As I have thought about this, we're on the right track. We will bring the world's championship of basketball to Cleveland. The Cavs left Hopkins Airport early this morning for the one and a half hour flight to Washington, where tonight, They'll meet the Washington Bullets in game number two of the best of seven Eastern Division semifinal playoff series. Washington won the opener Tuesday night at the Coliseum before the largest crowd in NBA playoff history. Without a doubt, uh, with Hayes and Bing and Unseld and Chenier, uh, you can't help but respect their basketball team and you know that it's gonna be one heck of a battle. Yeah, we're, we're gonna have to play the best basketball we've ever played to win, win the series with Washington. How do you beat Wes Hansel? Well, you don't beat him too many times. You know, uh, to me, he's a superstar. You know, the things he does out on the floor are unbelievable. So he uses strength, and I try to run him and get him a little tired, you know. So it's, uh, it's quite a matchup. The Cavs uh, run a very different offense. I mean, you see with most teams, they do a lot of off-the-ball movement. Jimmy is, uh, you know, he's, he's really matured as a player, so Every game, it becomes a little bit more difficult to play. Jim Jones has been playing injured since the season started and since we left camp. And he's been doing a very good job injured. But is there something that we don't know about, something that's more serious? Well, I don't know right now. That's uh, one, one reason I'm not answering the question. That best of seven playoff series is now tied. Two teams will play again tonight at the Coliseum starting at 8 o'clock. Standing room only, a crowd of more than 21,000 is expected. Standing room only, available at our Coliseum box office. We do suggest you get out here as soon as possible to purchase them. 8.50. You're welcome, man. The thing that sticks out in my mind was the fans. These are football fans. These are world champion Brown fans. They would cheer for basketball. Well, you hear them saying, let's go Cavs. There's a nice attendance, 21,312. A new NBA playoff attendance record. This is before ESPN. This is before Bird and Magic, you know, before the NBA really took off. People literally didn't even know who the Cavaliers were. 
The odds against the Cavaliers succeeding and lasting was really stacked against them. Two point lead for Cleveland, 80 to 78. But, but again, to play we're just speaking about game. the crowd, man. That that was the whole essence of that time for us. The crowd was the thing that fueled us all. So much chaos, but it was control, happy chaos. And it's tied at 85. Clemens will inbound on the left side. Clemens looks and waits, flips to Snyder. Snyder sideline left, Snyder on the dribble drive, to the hoop, put it up, oh! Snyder scores in four seconds to go! And the Bullets take time! Cleveland 87! I mean, you could literally feel the concrete under the seats were shaking from the, the vibrations from the fans. They were just going bananas. Seven four. Here comes the play. Unsell wants it underneath. Snyder knocks it free. Ball picked up by Chanel. Shoot that. Ball go up. Go for it. Cavaliers win. The Cavaliers win. 87 85. I've ever been in a building that ever was louder than the way those those crowds were. It really was where the Cavs were embraced. That's where they really became, you know, Cleveland's basketball team. I'm still doing it. Let it go, Brian. Man, it's so quick. Yeah. The doctor was telling me that that's a that that's a weak bone in in the, in the first place, and it takes a while to heal and. Uh, it had been giving me trouble uh, all through the season. You know, it was just one of them things uh, that happens, you know. Jim, you know, it goes without saying, you must be tremendously disappointed to come this close and then have it all come to an end. Yeah, I am, you know, uh, not so much for me, you know, but for the other guys, you know. Uh, they put in a lot of work this season, you know, and uh, things got bad, we all stuck together, and uh, sometimes you only come this way once, you know, and we figured this was our chance, you know. The passion that Nick has in him was the same passion that this city has. Determination, joy, toughness, the whatever it take type attitude, and that's, to me, Nick Milletti. forget 15 and 67 <laughs> it's been 50 years you got to remember that I mean when you're playing the Knicks and you're playing the Lakers and so on what the hell are we gonna do win I mean get serious and then little by little we built it up so I don't know of a story where there's somebody that was like a mailman that ended up owning all the sports teams in town, and if there weren't sports teams, he just made them. If there wasn't a building, he just built it. A lot of what happened was just serendipitous, you know? It didn't take any courage at all because the need was there. It, it had to be. I was thrilled to see that when they won the championship. I was very proud of that. There were millions of people there. Boy, what a ride, huh? Bill Fitch made the Cleveland selections, which brought about a rather unique situation. With the chance that he may soon be leaving this city, he was picking players for a team next season he may be coaching against. I suppose uh, the best thing to do is, is to thank you all for uh, nine of the best years of my life. I remember El Lopez telling me, uh, you're going to Cleveland is what? And I said, basketball coach. He didn't know they had a basketball team here. He says, that's a tough city, senor. I think he meant it was a tough city to leave. I hope that 
Ted and the new uh, board will be able to bring Cleveland Championship because we know we have the greatest sports fans in the world here. All we need to do is give them a winner. When Ted Stepien bought the Cavaliers, he tried to put a championship club together with free agents. He opened the vault and the team went from 28 wins in 1980 to 15 last year. I realized that in order to attain that the profitability, we have to attract more fans, so we, have, we may have to spend more money to get certain players or make some changes. It was pretty clear that they were the bottom of the NBA in terms of attendance, tantamount to a college game or maybe a good high school game. His hopes to improve the team this season are already facing problems. Unhappy players with guaranteed contracts upset with the way the coach runs camp. There was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal about the Stepien rule, which had to be put in place because you shouldn't be able to trade all your first round picks away. If we can't show a near profit next year with a playoff contender, then I have to consider moving the club. That kind of thing for any city can really be, be a kick in the gut. There is a possibility that uh, I'll be talking to Gunn for them to be a minority partner with us. A guy who's become a very good friend of mine, David Stern, who was talking to us about acquiring the franchise. And I said, David, this thing is losing three million bucks a year. And there's no draft choices, no way to rebuild. Well, why would I buy it? And he wasn't really able <laughs> to answer me. So they sold us picks that they fit in in the 85 draft. In the second round, we were looking at players, and by far the best player, if he was able to play, was Hot Rod Williams. Turned out to be one of the greatest value draft picks in Cavaliers history. I don't think people understood how important he was because he could have been a starter on any team in the league, and he stayed on this team and uh, come off the bench and we didn't lose one thing. Come off the bench and we got better. We had started the process, but we actually went through the draft without a general manager. We wanted somebody who knew what it took to put together a team that could win a championship. We interviewed other people, but Wayne, Wayne stood out. Wait, if you met Wayne, he just, he was a presence. Well, I think Wayne will be remembered as an executive first, but boy, he was a heck of a player. Now, this is the nicest, kindest uh, guy you'll ever meet. But when he walks into the building, you know, you sort of stop in your tracks. The barriers that he broke were unprecedented. And they're so meaningful to, to myself and to so many people. I recall a basketball trip with, and I was the only black person in my entire high school. And I was a team in my entire high school. And we stopped at a uh, dairy store. And I would end uh, with the rest of the team and sat there and never was served. It was brought to management's attention and they finally did wait on me and gave me a brown bag and told me to go, to go to the bus. And uh, I think that's the first time it really hit me. The effect it's had on me, it's inspired me. Uh, it gives me greater inspiration to succeed and be, be the best. Probably obvious that I can't make judgments about players because I can't see them. But I can certainly know and understand whose judgment I do respect. And then Waynes was one of those people that became quite clear. He was the right person to go with to try and get that franchise back on its feet. He's not afraid to surround himself with great people and trust those people. I think a coach has to be a, a tireless worker. I think he has to understand the changing NBA. It's, it is changing. No, I, I'm not going to write a speech, you know, I think you, if you don't know where you've come from and how you got there, you'll never will. The combination of Wayne Embry and Lenny Wilkins was a one-two punch. Lenny was the coach. Wayne was really the guy that put the talent together. He saw character every bit as important as talent. Wayne refers a lot to Brad Doherty. When Brad Doherty was coming out of North Carolina, a lot of people thought he was soft. <laughs> Wayne said, no, 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 Brad Doherty's our guy. All right, here we go. And now David Stern is going to announce the number one selection for the first pick in the 1986 NBA draft. The Cleveland Cavaliers select Brad Doherty, the University of North Carolina. The 86 draft was transformative. The Cavs had slated Ron Harper at eight. So they got Ron Harper at eight. I can liken him to Paul Pressey. Some say he could be as good as Michael Jordan. He's that type of talent. Jordan to the lane, the 12-footer blocked by Harper! Talk about 
with like Brad Doherty at center, and you had Mark Price, who's a, this, this awesome point guard, and you wanted to emulate his shooting. Uh, I'm excited that, uh, you know, I'm on the team, and uh, I know Cleveland doesn't know much about Mark Price, but, you know, not too long, they will. You had Hot Rod Williams. Hot Rod drives to the middle, puts it up, and in. You had Larry Nance. There was him, Price, Doherty, Hot Rod. They had all those guys that if one was having an off night, the other three would pick up the slack. Who would have thought it? The infants of the NBA riding a four-game win streak after dumping Detroit last night. And the hot streak has been fueled by Hot Rod. The rookie, John Williams, averaging 21 points and 12 rebounds in the four wins. I think we're matching very, very well. Uh, to be a young team, an inexperienced team, you know, when you go out the first couple of times, you really try to establish something. And I think we did when we went out and played the first two games. If we can play the rest of the games together, we'll, uh, we'll do okay. That's who he was. Now he just picked that guy off, that Brad Rowland. There we go. The guy got pressure on him. You see, you see that play? That's good basketball. That's just good basketball. Dribbling to the circle, bounce to Hot Rod. back then you had the Cavs you had you had Detroit which which had a sort of a lock hold on on the east at that point and you had this up-and-coming emerging Bulls team with Michael Jordan well when you, when you think about some of the best teams that never win a championship that Cavaliers team was right up there with the best of them but it's not about that I think what they did was they captivated the city I think it's a special fraternity that they have. That's why there is a, a lot of respect and love for those teams. And even though we did not get all the way through against Michael Jordan, and they knew that Wayne was really the architect. What he was able to accomplish when he was hired in 1971 as the first African-American uh, GM in all sports, not only being the first, right, probably had way more scrutiny on him than anybody, but then having success within the position. Wayne Embry, by virtue of the vote of the Honors Committee, it is an honor to enshrine you as a contributor into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. History would dictate pretty much what we could and couldn't do growing up in the 40s and 50s. And there were a lot of times when I would become discouraged. But my parents, my family would always say to me, don't become discouraged, make history. Thank you very much. So I came back to Ohio to be a GM of a major league franchise, and that was big for me. I just will never ever forget the acceptance from the fans. It was just an unbelievable, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. It was just an unbelievable feeling. I have a great deal of pride in seeing others be successful. And I always tell young people when I speak, it's not about me anymore. It's about you, and hopefully what I've been able to achieve has inspired you. Me seeing Wayne Embry in, in a GM position, Lindsey Gottlieb, what does her being on an NBA bench mean for young women growing up in, in Northeast Ohio and across the country and across the world? It breeds life into, into youth. Man, without Wayne, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be where we are.